Whenever we review anything that costs more than 500 bucks, audiophiles love to chime in with, you know, Andrew, you could buy blah, 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 blah for less. And sometimes you're right, but not always. And I'm not saying this to pick on you audiophiles, especially those of you on a budget. I get it. This video is about what I like to call audiophile math and how it can convince you you're saving money when you're not. So let's go ahead and break the audiophile internet one more time and hit that like button and subscribe because we got to talk about audiophile math. Yeah. When it comes to hi-fi and frankly home theater, here's how audiophile math works. So long as the individual price of any given product or products retail for less than the price of a more expensive product, you're automatically saving money, right? Eh, not so much. Let's look at a budget example. The Cantu YU6 powered loudspeaker. The YU6 currently has a retail price of $449 for the pair. And if you've not yet seen my review of these speakers, we'll link to it down in the description. If you want my too long, didn't watch it review review, I think the YU6 speakers are fantastic and are a great starting point, especially if you're on a budget and limited in space. For $449, you get a pair of two-way bookshelf speakers that have all of the amplification they will ever need to sound their best built in. You also get a basic capable DAC, a phono preamp, a subwoofer out, and Bluetooth. Again, all built in. All of this for $449 a pair. Not bad. And just when you are starting to feel good about your purchase decision, without fail, there will be those who will tell you that you can do way better for less. Just get a pair of bookshelf speakers for less, make them to an integrated amplifier, again, for less, and get a DAC for, you guessed it, less. And so long as we look at each product individually, all three of those statements are essentially true. But this is audiophile math. You see, it's possible to get one, maybe even two of these things for less than the YU6's asking price, but virtually impossible to get all three or four. The one step in this fun little math equation that many audiophiles fail to do is add. Yeah, who taught you yeah. math? I'm having a bit of fun with that last comment, but it's true. Too often, and this is just human nature, or maybe it's consumer nature, we look at the price of an individual item and compare it to another seemingly similar item based largely on, wait for it, what we can see. In this instance, a pair of YU6 look like nothing more than a basic two-way bookshelf loudspeaker that costs almost $450. It's not difficult to find a similar bookshelf speaker, one that has a one-inch soft dome tweeter made it to a five or six-inch mid-bass driver for less than $450. A quick Google search turned up more than a dozen, one of which being the $199 Kanto YU Passive, which is essentially the same speaker as the YU6, but with all its guts ripped out. So let's, let's start with that. We've now spent 200 of our $450 budget. Again, our budget is based on the original price of the YU6 speakers. Now the YU6 is powered by a 100 watt Class D amplifier. Doing a quick Google search of 100 watt Class D amplifiers turned up numerous, albeit generic, options, retailing between 79 and $200 US. If we go with the cheapest, which is a $79 Amazon recommended iMia, we're left with 171 bucks. Going this route means we still need to add a DAC with Bluetooth as well as a phono preamp in order to match the features of the YU6. Remember, we only have $171 remaining in our budget. And we've already had to forego the subwoofer in this breakdown because there's no way to add one using the iMia, at least not on this budget. So let's just scratch the iMia and go with something a little more inclusive, like the Loxy A30 integrated amplifier at $186. We're subbing in the A30 because it is an amplifier, it also has a built-in DAC as well as Bluetooth, and gives us a pair of analog audio inputs that we can add a phono preamp to. However, at $186 plus the $200 we already spent on speakers, we're left with only $64 bucks to get a phono preamp. Now, FX Audio does sell a standalone phono preamp for $40, which is $24 under our budget, meaning you can build a component system for less than the YU6's, so... I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm wrong. This video's over. What does Christy think? <laughs> You're a hack. You should retire. 
Well, not so fast, not getting rid of me that easily. You see the A30, while having a lot of options we need for this exercise, options like a sub out, analog input, DAC, Bluetooth, etc., does come up short in a few key areas. The A30 is a little shy of our 100 watt per channel goal, which is what you get with the YU6. Also, it has only one optical audio input, whereas you get two with the YU6. And this is handy if you want to connect your system to your TV and another digital source like a CD transport you might have laying around from 2005. So to get all of that extra functionality of the YU6, you have to step up to at least an Amazon Echo Link at 299 which is over budget. And that's before we add in the cheap phono preamp from FX Audio at 40 bucks. Never mind the ancillary accessories like cables we now need to connect all of these devices and speakers together. This same exercise can be applied to mid-fi and higher end gear as well, though admittedly, as you climb up the ladder of price, you can sometimes assemble a comparable system for the same or maybe a little less than the original higher priced option. There's something to be said for simplicity. While individual component costs may ultimately be less when doing this type of breakdown for, say, an Audiolab 6000A Play, having all of the functionality and design internal to one device can be its own type of savings. At the end of the day, if it takes three, four, or more devices to match what one does, you now have to consider other costs like cables and furniture, which I don't have to tell you, especially in audiophile circles, adds up quick. And for my home theater fam, I didn't forget about you. Home theater folks may be the worst offenders when it comes to audiophile math. Take for example our recent review of the Sony HT-A9, which is a 12 channel virtual surround sound system that uses only four speakers and a subwoofer, which shouldn't be considered optional. Sony. The A9 with the SW5 subwoofer will run you just under $2,300. The common thread in that review was viewers saying that what a ripoff the system was because you can totally build a similar setup for way less. Really? Way less? Let's see. A pair of Yamo S801 bookshelf speakers will run you $120, and I'm picking the S801s because they are comparable in size and driver complement to the Sony A9 speakers. Only, we're going to need 11 of them because we're building a 7.1.4 Atmos setup. So, 11 Yamos are going to cost $714. Not bad. Clearly cheaper than the Sony A9's per speaker price of $575, if you could buy them a la carte, which you can't. A comparable subwoofer will cost another $300, and that's shopping conservatively, bringing our total to $1,014 for all of the speakers and subwoofers needed to match the surround presence of the Sony system. Now here's where things get really interesting. We need an 11 plus channel receiver capable of Dolby Atmos and 8K60 4K120 pass-through. A search on Crutchfield turned up four options, the least expensive being the Denon X6700H, which currently retails for $2,999. Add it all up and we're over four grand and that doesn't include the cost of mounts and cables, a divorce attorney. Ah. Uh. Uh. So in this scenario, the HTA9 potentially saves you $1,700, not to mention your marriage. Now, I am not saying that the performance you get from the Sony A9 and its seven virtual speakers is exactly the same as having dedicated speakers, but that's not the point here. The critique was that you could do what the Sony A9 does for less, and I'm saying, you can't. While the cost of the HD A9 system is not cheap, like with my previous Kanto example, upon closer inspection, the price gets easier to justify, especially when you take into consideration what you're actually getting. So if you only look at your system, at least financially, as individual pieces or purchases, audiophile math will always show you a way to solve a component issue for less money. But if you stop and really add it all up, you're not always saving which raises the question, how much could we have saved in the long run just buying the thing we wanted, as expensive as it may have been in the first place? So that's my breakdown of audiophile math, but now I'm curious what Christy thinks of this concept. Oh, I think audiophiles are gonna have all sorts of feelings <laughs> about this topic, mm -hmm. and there's gonna be a lot of, you're wrong! <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but hey, it's just another Wednesday at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look, I think that the thing that I am anticipating people 
in the comments coming at you with, and you probably have already anticipated this yourself, is they're going to bring up that mythical place that is known as the used market. Ah, uh, yes. Where they can find anything and everything. <laughs> For a for dollar. so much less. <laughs> it's practically free. They're practically being paid to take it off someone's hands. Yeah. It's perfect. It's yeah. so much better than the new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it was made back in the day when, you know, audio really mattered. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not saying that they are not sometimes right. There, mm -hmm. there can be times where you can find something on the used market. Yeah. And, and piece together something for a lot less and you may come out with something really great um yeah. but you have to be willing to not only put in the time mm -hmm. to research products like that you mm -hmm. have to be willing to take a chance on that they may not operate as promised yeah they may not show up at all <laughs> they may arrive damaged mm -hmm. uh, i mean there's a number of things that could happen when you're buying on the used market yeah unless you're buying something like in person used yeah yeah somewhere that has like a consignment area of their shop or just is a shop that's known to stock new and used. yeah, yeah. or you're like you can go Maybe it's off of like Facebook Marketplace or something and you can go in person. Sure. But I mean, if you've ever sold anything like that on Facebook Marketplace, you as the seller know what a nightmare that can be. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of tire kickers, right? Yeah. But if you're just looking at like eBay or something like Audio Gone, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, there's always that inherent risk that the thing that's going to show up, it may not work. And yeah. I think a lot of the times you're just going to be stuck with something. The glorification of the used market does not come without its pitfalls, you know? So. Absolutely. And there's, there's one thing you're absolutely right about talking about the used market, because even before we get to this part of the conversation, I'm anticipating there's going to be a dozen of you already that are like, what about used? Oh yeah. They've, they've, that, they, they paused, they, they paused like <laughs> they may, they might've gotten past the intro yeah. card. Yeah. They already hit pause. Their fingers were already warmed, warmed up. up. Yeah. I mean, I, I can guarantee you, we're going to that this video is going to be live for about two minutes. Yeah. And there's going to be at least a half a dozen. Used, 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 yeah. used, used. What about used? Yeah. Yeah. And but, I'm going to say, why don't you watch? Keep watching keep the video. Yeah. But here's the thing about used that I think people are starting to realize in 2021 is, yes, the used market two, three, four years ago was a wealth of inexpensive top tier things because everyone was getting rid of the thing that was old in favor of the thing that was new. Now that we're having supply chain issue problems in the world and new things are just as hard to get a hold of as maybe even those quintessential vintage ones that everyone has always wanted, the price discrepancy between new and used has started to shrink. It really has. Um, and so once again, cheaper, yes, but maybe not cheaper within the realm or confines of your current budget. And I think that that's important to note because even like when we were restoring our 780, you know, we were looking at having to purchase or acquire other 780s for parts. And a 780 several years ago, 100 bucks, maybe 150. Now those things are five, six, seven hundred dollars. And I love our 780 to death, but I'm not going to lie and say that you can go get a Cambridge Audio AXR 100 for less than a current 780. And after all of the updates we did to ours, our 780 is not cost effective. It's not advantageous to do what we did. Our, our, our thing costs way more than that unit is worth, but you get it for 600 bucks in an AXR 100. The other thing I believe is happening okay. is, and, and this is kind of an issue or something that I think is inherent in the hobby itself, is there are a lot of gatekeepers. Mm. There are a lot of audiophiles, you know, that are, that have been fans or practicing the hobby for years and years and years. Sure. And they are, they're very hesitant to try new things. They often poo poo the new thing. Because, you know, A, you can always get something better for less mm -hmm. <laughs> or the vintage thing, the old thing yeah. performs far better than this brand new thing that they were never going to buy anyway. Right. And it's really not about whether that product is any good or if it performs as advertised. It's really about talking other people out of it. 
because okay. I think they see that as change mm. that they do not want to see take place. Yeah. I really think that that is psychologically at the heart of a lot of what you see in the comments section on YouTube or in audiophile forums, you know, the people that are trying to convince others. Mm -hmm. It's not even about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's mostly talking to other people to let them know, A, you don't know what you're talking about. Why would you ever consider that other product? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's not any good. When they themselves haven't even tried it. Or don't you know, like, for example, the A9, don't you know, you can do this for this. And, yeah. and it does. It sounds very compelling at first, I will admit. And it's a, I think it's an effective tactic. If we're going with the gatekeeping conversation, I think it's a, it, it is an effective tactic because who doesn't want to be excited about, say, a thousand dollar widget only to have someone drop in like a savior from on high and say, did you know? This widget's 350 if you go over here, you know, yeah. and boom, all of a sudden you're like, well, 350 that's better for me in my pocketbook. You end up with the 350 thing only to get home and you're playing with it. And you're like, but wait a minute, didn't the thousand dollar thing do this, 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 and this? And I, that's what I wanted. And yeah. then eventually that same person or people or thread or group is going to be like, okay, well, you got the 350 thing. Now what you need to do is go get this other $400 thing because it's really better than the built-in thing and the thousand dollar thing. Well, now we're close to 800 bucks. Uh, yeah, it's how audiophile math works. Yeah, it's a total domino effect. Yeah. And I think it confuses, especially I think it confuses a lot of people that are new mm -hmm. to the industry, to the, not the industry, but to the hobby or, or audio or yeah. buy, buying, you know, they're, they're looking for their, they're shopping for their first. Anything. Anything. Yeah. Um, and it can be very overwhelming because there's so much to choose from. Absolutely. You know, and I think everyone can look and at their own experiences mm -hmm. and think of a time where they knew they wanted something mm -hmm. X product X. Yeah. And in their investigations, in their research, they are led to getting something totally different and they end up regretting it. Oh, that happens daily in our comments. Yeah. Happens daily. People sharing those, those, I don't want to say horror stories, but just sharing those stories of like, the 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 rabbit hole gone wrong mm -hmm. and audiophile math is a great way to go down rabbit holes it really is so anything else no no can't wait to this one's gonna be fun yeah <laughs> this one is no, undoubtedly gonna be fun and i look forward to all of the rebuttal videos <laughs> that other creators are no doubt bound to make so anyway guys <laughs> that's 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 it for us today let us know what you guys think of audiophile math down in the comments below. And while you're down there, I have a question for you. And that is, how much money have you spent or maybe wasted trying to avoid buying the expensive thing only to end up with the expensive thing in the end? And what was the expensive thing? I really, really want to know. So let us know down in the comments below. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links Christy left for you down below, know that that's a great way that you've supported this channel and the work that we do here. And it also helps support dealers and uh, retailers that are interested in growing this hobby the right way. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audio Phone. That's it. That's it for us today. Um, so remember... The only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Bye.